Hey everyone, and welcome to this session on the trends in DevSecOps and cloud development. Uh, you've got a few two uh, cool, I'd like to say, developers, <laughs> um, myself or Wise, um, a developer and security practitioner in background, and now founder and CEO at Permit IO. And with me, one of my favorite people is uh, Philip, our dev advocate. Uh, Philip, you want to add a few words about yourself? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, I'm a developer advocate, but I do have a background in engineering. Um, I used to lead a team at Cisco, uh, the, the front end efforts, especially at Cisco. Cisco is, is a, you know, a networking company and it involves a lot of security. So I'm sure I'll be able to have some input as well, uh, some interesting input when we come and, and talk about uh, dev security ops and, and cloud development this year and maybe the possible trends of next year. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of excited for this. It's always good to kind of sum up a year uh, and try to take a glimpse in what's coming forward. And I think uh, through this year, we've seen a lot of interesting things, both with just our own work and the work we do with our customers. And you especially, you're really at the front line, uh, engaging with people, helping them build things. So yep. uh, so, so I'm really excited to hear what, uh, what, how you summed it up. Um, and uh, so maybe that, that's a good place to start. Just uh, what are the highlights that you've seen working this year um, in both the DevSecOps space and in general in cloud development? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people... I mean, actually, software is is becoming very prominent uh, in in everyone's lives. Uh, not even just uh, the companies that are tech related, but also uh, you know just normal people that need to use tech these days. And uh, there is there is a big trend and a, a big prominence on actually having security uh, be part of those trends and be part of those ever growing companies that are involved in tech. Um, just to kind of take a few steps back, I think it's a, an interesting contrast how a few years ago. Um, we didn't treat security uh, as like a very, very big priority, um, at least not as high of a priority as it is right now. Uh, and what we noticed is, for example, take it back like 10 years, uh, nobody really cared about uh, authentication, uh, even more so about authorization. I don't think that was a concept uh, much, much back then, or, or at least a talking point. Um, and everyone built their homebrew solution. Everyone did everything on their own. And then move forward a few years until today, authentication is uh, is almost becoming a standard with every company. No developer wants to work on it because there's companies that do it better. And same thing with kind of authorization. I think, um, you know, it, it's becoming a, almost a, a thing that is a requirement. Security is growing ever higher. Um, and people just don't want to do the hard work and they're moving and trying to find solutions that, uh, you know, they can incorporate in a simple way uh, to save them time and to add value to the company. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a, a big thing that, that we saw uh, this year and it's going to grow even more into next year. Uh, I definitely agree. I think, um, you know, software is eating the world. Yeah. That's kind of a common understanding now. Everyone's realizing it. Um, but we see it like also with shift left, really more and more elements are moving to the developer side, more and more elements of both security operations. Everyone is, wants to start them as early as possible mm -hmm. uh, or starting to realize that if you try to add it later, it doesn't really work well. And then it's also a question. I think that's what you kind of touched on the question of what are the baseline, what are the fundamentals you're building on? Uh, how much you're trying to invent yourself and how much you're adopting as an existing best practice or tool that you can use. And I think maybe another interesting angle on that is that this is affecting a lot more people. So it's not just developers. Uh, we're seeing product managers, we're seeing um, sales, we're seeing professional services, we're seeing the security people also from the other angle. Everyone's kind of uh, honing in on the uh, DevSecOps angle. Everyone wants to uh, be able to chime in and how you do security on the development cycle itself, how you bake in security into the product in the earliest stages. And it's kind of funny to see like with product managers, they're not necessarily the most technical people, but they have to be now. They have to yeah. understand what it's like to be a developer and they have to understand how security works because they have to have those baselines uh, as part of a product. You can go without authentication today. And as you said, as opposed to 10 years ago, uh, no one wants to build it from scratch. Authentication mm -hmm. is 
a proven thing now. Uh, you Just like it used to be like 10 years ago, we had that understanding of things with encryption already. You don't want to roll your own. No yeah. one thinks that understanding has already kind of taken another step forward with authentication. You don't want to roll your own. And uh, I think uh, we're starting to see that with authorization as well. In general, maybe everything that isn't a core part of your product, and especially if it's not a core part and it has a ability to affect the stability or security of your product, it's better off to use at least an open source solution or at least the best practices that the market has come up with uh, yeah. instead of trying to do it on your own. And uh, I think it's interesting to see, especially with the type of customers that uh, we're seeing. So one of the things that really surprised me this year is the amount of healthcare companies, either companies that are uh, actual healthcare providers or ones providing services to healthcare providers or around uh, healthcare or Medicare. Um, so I was surprised to see how many of those are, are moving the fastest with adopting the new best practices, with adopting policy as code, with adopting uh, authorization as a service or permissions mm -hmm. as a service. Um, so as, as someone who's really at the front lines, can you maybe share um, how how did you engage with those customers? What are the right. things that they're asking? I mean, I think just taking one step back as well, just to highlight the point on, you know, having people like product managers have to be, uh, you know, part of software now. I think what we're seeing is that in general, security is very difficult. It, it's a very difficult concept that requires, you know, a lot of knowledge to grasp, especially for developers. It requires a huge amount of knowledge to implement. Um, and it's hard to implement security uh, within an app. There's too many things that you need to make sure that are working and no developer wants to be put in a situation where they uh, write a piece of code and you know it, it doesn't work or it doesn't work the way it should. And then there is some security flaws in the system. That's probably a developer's worst nightmare. So I think what we're seeing now is a, is a big shift, shift to kind of um, software that's very easy to use, very abstract. Um, and that's kind of where we talk about no code UI. And, and, and now going back to client meetings, I think a lot of the companies that we spoke to, companies that are in healthcare, uh, in, in security, uh, they, you know, they, they have this whole team of developers that are willing to, to, to build this, but they don't want to build it themselves. They want to, they want to use something that's already out there. And that's not just to make it easier for uh, the developers, but it's also to allow other team members to be able to use the product and have an understanding of the product. Um, so this is kind of what we're seeing with our clients. More clients are actually uh, coming to us and they're asking us about the solution um, that you know might be offered. Um, and you know they're very interested in seeing how they can do it in an abstract way where they can engage the rest of the team. Right, right. So it's not just about the developers uh, getting the security tools. It's about the developers enabling all the other folks to work on those tools as well. Yeah. I think that actually puts us in a very interesting uh, junction between two trends. So one trend that uh, is very apparent and kind of talked about is the shift left and um, and kind of security becoming ingrained and everyone becoming a developer to some degree, everyone working on um on security uh, and becoming something that is unavoidable for basically all the personas, um, all the stakeholders within a company. And another trend is the growth of code and specifically policy as code to manage all of these complexities. And there's there's some uh, somewhat of a tension there. So uh, as a developer, you want to manage things as code, especially complex things like uh, uh, policy is code, infrastructure is code, configuration is code, uh, everything is code is basically the hottest trend right now. Um, but code is not accessible yet to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, product managers might be a little tech savvy, but they're not full-blown developers. The security people themselves that need to work with this, they're not full-blown developers, at least not most of them, uh, but they need to work on this. So. Uh, on one hand, we want to manage things as code. On the other hand, um, we want to enable everyone to work on this. And these are, are seem to be apparently in conflict. Um, I have some ideas on where this is going to be. I think one thing that you mentioned is through um, kind of low code. So interfaces that, um, that make it easier for not full-blown developers to work 
uh, on these problems and maybe even generate code for them. So mm -hmm. no code, no code interfaces that generate code, I think are, uh, are are a swell thing. That in the end of the day, you get that baseline best practice of policy as code or configuration as code. You manage it in a Git repository. You can do code reviews on it. You can do tests. You can do benchmarks. But you can have people at the top line generate that code without necessarily fully understanding it. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, the low code, no code space is growing very quickly. No code aspects are becoming uh, a key part of almost every product. Uh, so just having that additional code generation thing, I think, uh, would really become very valuable there. And I think that also touches on another trend that we're seeing really exploding in these recent days, and that's uh, generative AI. So uh, machine learning component that you feed with some kind of low code interface maybe text prompts, maybe um, a form that you feel, maybe uh, another kind of uh, interface. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, that AI can generate text, code, interfaces, uh, documentation for you. So having low code interfaces that are then funneled into an AI that generates code, that sits in the Git repository, that the developers can then collaborate with with that uh, AI on, I think is uh, that's a very exciting space. And, um, you know, I, I don't really believe in AI is going to take over everything and all the developers be, be out of jobs or anything like that. It would The jobs would just change. It would be collaboration with that AI. Mm -hmm. it would be using that AI to generate code ourselves to enable, enable other people to generate code. And then still, I think that lower level of code as code is still a good thing that we have a lot of best practices on and how to manage uh, complexity on. So you have a single source of truth that, uh, that makes it easier. And what, what do you think of that? Or what are other trends that you're seeing? I mean, I I think it's, it's nice to see the retrospective of um, what has been happening before. And I think the first site where we saw uh, an O-code UI come into place was with um, website creation. And, uh, you know, it, it started off with people uh, and having to hire developers to build that. And then obviously they, there, there came the whole uh, kind of group of companies that designed this no code UI for not just uh, people with little technical skill. It was even designed for people with no technical skill to be able to produce that website for themselves and maintain it. And, and that was done to kind of reach a really big market and reach a really big audience. And I think most companies now, especially in, in developer security, because it's a really hard concept to grasp, uh, not just for developers, but also, you know, they want to include the people uh, that can't, uh, that may not have a technical background uh, into the whole space because of a bigger market. They're designing all these, all these kind of tools. I think everything that we see in software now very much revolves around automation. It's uh, it's anything that's complex and anything that can be automated and abstracted is done and is, uh, or, or ways are found to be done because it just kind of really gives a, a faster workflow for companies. Uh, it really makes it much more of an easier process. Um, so I think, especially with like we saw for ourselves, we, we saw a lot of companies in healthcare and compliance and, and I still wonder why there is such a big interest there. But I think it's because they have all these other compliance issues on top of them that they have to deal with. So because then at that point, it gets so difficult that they're looking for solutions to just ease the whole process. Uh, and, and and that's kind of my opinion, maybe why we might be seeing this kind of trend with healthcare. I think, um, but yeah. I think it's double fold. I think one, the complexity itself makes more people want compliance. because. Mm -hmm. When a system is very complex, especially if you're a security practitioner who is not highly technical, you're looking at another vendor and it, when it's essentially another attack service. It's another risk that you are taking on if you were starting to work with them. But on the other hand, you don't want to do it yourself. You don't want, you need that vendor, need that uh, other player to take some of the burden off of you. But then you need that vendor to work with you in a way that you can trust. And the best way that we have so far, which I don't think is that good, but it, it's better than nothing, kind of like democracy. It's, it's the best <laughs> the best option of all the rest that we've tried um, is compliance. So having the vendor meet the specific standard that you know is audited, that you know is standardized, that you know can be verified, uh, can really help you as you engage uh, in growing what you need to grow in your product or in your company. 
Um, and as more companies look at compliance as a way to standardize engaging with other uh, vendors, um, also these vendors need to find a way to be compliant. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and I think the spaces that are that have the most compliance pressure are healthcare, uh, fintech, um, so the security space itself, the government space. So that pressure on just we need to manage all of this complexity, so we need compliance. Um, forces a lot of companies to start with compliance at day one. Mm-hmm. And so they need to themselves adopt solutions to make the compliance easier. It's kind of a, I don't want to say vicious cycle, but it is a cycle. Like you need compliance, so you need better tools for the compliance, so you need better compliance for the tools, which need better tools and rinse and repeat. But I think at the end of the day, it's kind of a tide that floats all boats. Mm-hmm. The entire, the level of compliance, that the standard that we think of of what is the minimum compliance that a company should have is rising across the market. So I guess now that you can still start B2B businesses today and you don't have to have certification and they want, but I think like in three years from now, five years from now, that will basically be non-existent. And um, talking about uh, better tools, how yeah. how do you kind of see authorization as a service in that space? Because, uh, you know, we, we see a huge amount of interest coming in from different companies uh, in different genres um, of tech. So, you know, how, how do we see that kind of going forward? So I think with that, it's really, uh, in the end of the day, if you look at compliance standards like SOC 2, ISO, um, even the GG, GDPR and CCPA, definitely things like HIPAA, in the end of the day, when you break it down, it's about 70 to 90% about access control. Mm-hmm. It's about how you decide within your processes or within the products you're building, who can do what, in which scenarios. So a lot of times you can uh, make the work of just having processes in place, having uh, human readable policies that the humans in your organization have to follow. But it's a lot easier to make sure that people follow things if they're automatic uh, guardrails, if there are automatic checks that or more or better yet, automatic gates that control who can do what. Mm-hmm. Um, and that applies both for what you're building internally, how your organization works, but also what you provide to your end customers. If you're building a product, in order for you to be compliant, you need to bake in access control and permissions into that product, both in how you operate it and how people use it. And your customers will have to have uh Access controls, uh, everyone kind of thinks about RBAC as kind of the baseline. Yeah. RBAC is kind of the role based access control, is the bread and butter of um, basically of compliance or permissions in, in any product that you build. So everyone today engaging with products knows to ask for RBAC. Um, but I think that's just the beginning. The complexity is continuing to rise. The amount of people that need to be compliant is increasing because of that cycle that I mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's getting to a point where um, having authentication, having identity management, having permissions as a baseline uh, to start with with anything you're building um, is kind of the easiest way to go. It removes a lot of friction from down the road because if you try to add it later, it will be more painful. Um, And I think more and more people are realizing it just because of the basic demands that they're getting. If the demands before were like, just give me a product that works. Now it's give me a product that works and meets all of my standards, especially my security and compliance standards. But I think in this case, there is a lot of companies that are going to have the dilemma. And it's like, do I do I use this now or do I use this later? And I think many mm-hmm. small startups, um, I think it's either a good thing or a bad thing if they use it later because there already might be for the process. And obviously uh, the, the most difficult part, especially when it comes to authorization is like, can I implement this now? Have I not started too late? Uh, is it possible for me to move everything? Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, for, for startups, that's still, I, I think, manageable. But then think about all the really big companies. And, and we're talking like big fintech companies, a big healthcare. They've got their own homebrew solution. Uh, it's very hard to scale. They're getting more people. It's, it's you know, it takes up so much like time for the developers to be able to manage this solution. And here the decision comes like, do, do they do they move? Do they stick with what they have? Is it worth it? Is it worth the time? Um, like, do, do you have an opinion about that? Do you think, do you have a best practice of maybe what people should adhere to, like a top two yeah. tips or something like that? 
Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and I'll say that uh, even like within Permit, that's something that, uh, for example, with Asaf, my co-founder, and our CTO, I discuss uh, these kind of dilemmas on a uh, at least a monthly basis. I'd say mm -hmm. There's always this tension between um, having higher quality and having a higher velocity. There, you always have to choose. You can't have both. Uh, so it's about finding the right equilibrium point. For you at each moment in time and as every product every company every problem space is a snowflake uh i don't think there is a silver bullet answer like a panacea that this is the right balance point for everyone but i think recognizing that, that there is a balance point and kind of enabling you to move on that spectrum is really the way to go and i definitely don't think like I'd, I'd want to say as a vendor, I want to say everyone has to have a, a authorization as a service that they want. I'd like to say that, but I don't actually believe that. I think what you want to have is the amount of access control that you need at each point, and you should invest in it the minimum that you have, but be aware that it's going to change. Be aware that more requirements around compliance, around security, about Features, access control, for example, is, is really about how people use the product. So that really mm -hmm. translates into features that the customer asks for. Give me invites, give me impersonation, give me approval flows, um, a lot of things like that. Um, so those things are coming, if you like it or not. Um, so it's about finding your equilibrium point, but planning to be able to transition into more things. And there, I think best practices can really uh, be helpful. Things like policy as code, it doesn't, really, to use policy as code doesn't cost you that much. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just another way to define your access control. It doesn't add a lot of overhead. Um, decoupling your policy from your code. So having a separate microservice for authorization, even if it's just like a Lambda function that initially just returns through uh, like it checks if it's your email, it returns true. If not, it returns false. Even that is better than having that same line of code embedded within within the product itself. Because uh, yep. then when you want to upgrade, you have a box ready. You can just pour more um, um, capabilities into it and upgrade it gradually. And in general, I think that's one of the best practices and trends that already uh, saw its fruition and fruitation and growth in the cloud computing space. Microservices are, I don't think you have to break everything into a microservice, but using microservices to a certain degree, having some granularity, how you decouple your services is really a very smart best practice. If you plan to scale your software and if you're building a business, you are planning to scale your software, uh, microservices, at least to some degree, having a few microservices is a must. Mm -hmm. And then when you have that, you, you can, um, trying to identify the areas that are um, that are separate, that are not part of your core product. Um, so uh, classic things are like authentication, billing, analytics, uh, permissions, um, databases. Um, you can start with something that you grew on your own or start with an open source or start with a service uh, in the cloud, but you want it separate. You don't want it locked in and coupled with your own code. So when new demands come in, you can uh, switch in place and uh, and grow quickly. I think that's that's about it. So summarize um, microservices, decoupling your code, finding the right balance point for you throughout at each point in time, and gradually adapting more services and tools so you can meet the standards instead of constantly having to refactor your own code, which is very expensive. Hey, and I and I think and I think with this situation and kind of applies to any kind of developer tool product for a company to use is actually finding the problem within your own system and seeing if it can be improved. And I think quite often, um, you know, it's, it's hard to realize if that problem exists, or maybe it's hard to realize to take the first steps to actually do that. Now, of course, at Permit, we would love for everyone to use authorization and to implement it as a full stack solution. But there are sometimes situations where, of course, you know, someone might find a homebrew solution more beneficial. Uh, maybe there are some cases where, you know, it, it might be maybe not necessarily easier, but maybe more compliant or or maybe something like that. Do you have any opinions about that? Like the mental load that you need is easier. Like 
I know that if I'm writing the code, I can trust it because I trust right. myself. I don't know, <laughs> Philip, I don't know. You, you seem like a nice guy, but I don't know. Can I trust that you? That doesn't always work, know. though. <laughs> um, so it's, at least in the mental capacity, it's easier yeah. to start with smaller things that you do on your own. But it's important to remember that you probably don't want to stick with them throughout time. It's good for a while. Uh, there's a limit of how much you can build every little thing. In the end of the day, as a developer, as a product owner, there is your own specific unique product that you want to build. It mm -hmm. would be a shame to waste your energy on building other products that already exist. It's essentially reinventing the wheel. It is. Yeah, it is. And um, I... I mean, I think in general, um, when there is a solution, um, any solution for any company that can be uh, that that a company can save time on, um, I think that's really beneficial in general. Um, mm -hmm. I think every every time that you notice that there is a problem and you notice that you struggle with the problem uh, and that there is no simple solution that you can find for it, that's usually the time when you should start thinking about kind of outsourcing it to other companies who have spent and dedicated a whole team uh, to making sure that the problem is understood, that the problem is solved and that the problem is solved very well. Uh, so then later on, when the company grows and it scales, you know, you don't have that issue coming up. Um, now, kind of moving on, I, I'd like to just kind of touch on and, and, and get your opinion about what do you think about um, just authorization growing in 2023, so next year? Uh, what kind of things can we see pop up that maybe people are not expecting? Um, and what would the generic kind of trends be? Uh, is there any kind of um, differences that will be noticeable that uh, we'll be able to see and maybe uh, kind of jump on the, the wagon and use? Um, to, to make it better for, for any kind of company? Yeah, so maybe it's worth to kind of um, glance back at the short history of modern authorization. So this is a nascent space. It basically started to grow around 2020, maybe 2019, if you're uh, really optimistic. Um, policies code, this kind of uh, grew solutions like OPA, Open Policy Agent, started to become more popular, especially with the growth of Kubernetes. And the infrastructure as code space, or in general, the infrastructure uh, in the cloud space really pushed uh, uh, the growth of this space. And now it's starting to come into the application development itself. Um, up till now, I'd say most people, when you ask them how you go about building authorization, they'd say, what do you mean? I, I, I build it on your own. I, I just take in a few if conditions into my code and, and that's it. I, I take a JSON web token, like the, the more sophisticated ones. Uh, I take a JSON web token uh, that I get from my authentication and I push a lot of claims into that. And then I write code that parses all the claims in the JSON web token. And according to that, I'll, I'll have uh, authorization within my, uh, within my product. Um, and I think people are as this space is growing and more people are becoming aware that there's an alternative to building on your own, it will gradually become a standard. I think it's already at the cusp of, 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 of that point. Um, and with it is also the maturity of the products themselves. Uh, open policy agent is just one example, but more policy engines are out there. Um, um, I think the most prominent new one that I want to mention is Cedar from mm -hmm. AWS. Yep. Um, so there's a policy engine that will soon be embedded into your uh, AWS cloud service. Um, and so this will really become the, the building blocks, policies code, engines to parse them, services to uh, have APIs for them. Those uh, within the next couple of months, even, I think, would become, would proliferate the space and become very commonplace. Then this question moves to how do people adopt this? And how do they maintain this and how do they work with this uh, long term? And there, what I think we'll see is that um, people don't want to maintain this crap. People don't want to uh, write policies uh, as code. People don't want to build interfaces on top of them. They just want to um, they just want to be able to check off this thing so they can actually focus on building the products. I know personally, like I, I found myself in, in my previous company, Brookup, I found myself rebuilding access control five times when the company wasn't even three years old. And uh, I definitely didn't like that. I, I wanted to focus on Of course. <laughs> um, and, and also the fact that I, I always thought, okay, this time I've built it. It's going to be perfect. Yeah. I don't have to touch <laughs> this crap again. And every time I was like, ah, oh, 
Okay. And suddenly, and suddenly you get the use case that just throws you off completely because you just didn't think of it. And it's it's yeah. very hard to come up with all the points to to make sure that you've covered everything, especially in security. So, yeah. Yeah. So, for example, we worked with uh, we worked actually with Cisco as a vendor, and they came yeah. in and said we want our own uh, not a vendor, sorry, as a as a co seller, um, and they said we want our own back office, and I was mm -hmm. like. I didn't think I'll need to two back offices. I didn't think that was them. And, and I had to go back to the drawing board. Um, so having those, so mentioning the back office, in the end of the day, um, access control is about experiences. It's about interfaces that people can use. User management with the ability to assign roles, API key management, secrets management, audit logs. So the ability for you as a vendor to see what, all of your customers did, all of the tenants did, and the ability for each of your tenants, each of your customers to see what they did on their own, um, the ability to ask permissions from another user, the ability um, to have an action that you're performing approved by another user. Um, this list just goes on and on, and it's really classic things. And I think these things should be ready-made. I think mm -hmm. they should be um, interfaces that you can just bake into your software, just like you bake in a logging screen, just like you bake in a checkout cart, um, just like you bake yeah. in dashboards. Um, this should be ready to bake in into your back office and to bake in into your product facing customers. So people won't have to deal with this. They don't have to think about reinventing this. They don't have to think about how to make this secure, how to make this compliant, yeah. it just work. Yeah. So I think the we're seeing a point where the infrastructure is getting really standardized. Policies code is both getting more polyglot, and but is also getting standards and best practices that people can adopt. Um, we're seeing APIs for this becoming very commonplace, and I think the next thing is the really the experiences, the interfaces. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also becoming standardized. So when you come to an uh, AI model or you come into a product, you will already know the interface that you're getting because it's the standard one. It has been customized for you, but it's a standard interface that allows you to work with complex policies and permissions. But the developer that built it didn't need to reinvent it, and you as a user don't have to relearn it. Um, and that's really, I think, one uh, the next step in, uh, in the permissions or authorization space. Yeah, I, I I see a, a common trend, and I think a lot of people, um, when we're talking about security and when we're talking about authorization, um, they understand, or at, at least the first the first people that even learn about authorization, uh, they they usually just understand it on the concept of admin and, and non admin, right? But mm. I don't think they they have a, a concept of understanding how complex it gets. And you've mentioned so many things uh, just now about you know API key management, uh, you know, a kind of uh, just m making sure that all of these uh, all of these examples are actually implemented and work. And then providing the experience for the user, and you know, I've been I've been a front end developer. That's kind of what what I really enjoy, uh, and and that's kind of what I like doing in my free time. And and I know how important uh, user experience is, especially when it comes to dealing with complex subjects. So I think you're an artist at heart, <laughs> and a creative artist at heart. I guess that's kind of true. <laughs> and and I can just and I can just see um, not only how much simpler it's going to make it, but how much the people are actually going to appreciate it um, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's about making things easy. It, you don't want to overcomplicate things. Nobody likes uh, learning about complex stuff and then trying to apply it. Uh, well, actually, maybe some do, but, uh, you know, that's... Uh... I think the difference is between working on learning and working on complex stuff that are at the core of what you want to do and having to deal with complex stuff that are just stopping you from actually building what you want. Um, yeah. because, you know, the stack is constantly becoming more uh, bigger, wider, uh, more scalable. So we need to specialize. You can't mm -hmm. do everything all of the time. So, mm -hmm. and then the focus shifts on what, what is your core? I think that's something that every developer, every company should ask themselves. What is our core? What mm -hmm. is it that we do and we focus on and is unique to us that no other company is doing? And... and that question, I think, can really uh, divide the space between the things that you should spend your time on and the things that you should just swipe off your table. Yeah, so exactly. You focus on the things you should focus on. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Um, so 
I think I, I'd want to add uh, a little bit from myself, just in general, what I think um, might happen uh, with with uh, with DevSecOps um, coming the next year. And I think, especially maybe focusing on the subject of our authorization, I think we're definitely going to see um, authorization evolve a lot. Uh, like we've mentioned, we're definitely going to see um, kind of uh, experiences come into place, experiences as part of DevSecOps, which I think is really interesting because usually it was just very core stuff uh, that, you know, hardcore developers were focusing on. But now we're actually getting to the stage where, you know, that abstraction, that no-code UI will come into place and uh, that management of all these uh, really important topics uh, will be, will be, will evolve and, and will become something that essentially becomes almost plug and play, which I think is, is, is great value to the whole developer community. Um, I think that there is going to be a whole increase in, in in the in the kind of um maybe other players in the market that do offer this kind of solution uh, but of course i think it's quite an in interesting thing that we see a lot of um other companies do infrastructure level authorization but very very little do application level authorization and and it seems like you know infrastructure is very important but also managing those permissions application level is very very important too uh so i'm curious to see if that focus kind of trends away or if it stays and, and how that's going to to evolve later on yeah for sure so i think we've covered some some good topics here i think um we had some uh recurring themes both with uh low code no code both with shift left um kind of speeding up and bringing all the other stakeholders not just developers into the mix uh, we touched on how compliance is um, speeding up through kind of a, well, not a vicious cycle, but some kind of cycle. Um, yep. We touched on how low-code, no-code interfaces are uh, going to power a lot of this, especially in the intersection with complex systems and with machine learning models. Um, we touched on how there's this tension between um, what you want to build and using policy as code for it, but enabling other people that are not necessarily code savvy to use policy as code and having uh, code generating low code interfaces come into that play. Um, we talked about what we see with our customers, uh, specifically in companies in general the space. Uh, we're seeing fintech and healthcare company, healthcare companies and security companies kind of lead the charge, both with dealing with compliance and adopting these new solutions for um, better security baked in into the products that they're working on. Um, and we covered other things, but I think these are the, like the main themes we touched on. Um, Philip, I had a blast talking to you as always. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I hope everyone uh, watching us also enjoy this and maybe gain a few tips or insights or at least interesting uh, trends to think about uh, for looking back at the year we had and uh, looking uh, at the upcoming year that we have. And uh, I hope we'll all have a, uh, a good, compliant, secure, and uh, filled with great software uh, year ahead of us. And uh... absolutely. And I think I think in general, it's it's important to mention that we are very kind of open. We, we love chatting with others, uh, especially about developer security. Uh, we're very easygoing. So, um, you know, we'd always we'd always recommend that, uh, you know, you jump on and join our Slack and ask us anything about security. And, you know, we've got a whole team here that's really eager and passionate about the subject. So I uh, would be most uh, interested in, in, in engaging in the conversation and, you know, seeing seeing what we can uh, what we can discuss and kind of the interesting topics we can cover. Yeah, if, if people watching us, if you enjoyed this conversation between Philip and I and you'd like to have a similar conversation, uh, just brainstorming ideas, talking about what you're building um, and getting uh, our input on it or just brainstorming around uh, security and cloud development. We love to do that. We just uh, It's fun for us. The, the reason we do what we do is because we love engaging with uh, other developers and other security practitioners. Um, if you can literally go on permit.io, there's a uh, button to schedule a Calendly session with us. You, you just pick a date and uh, we show up. Uh, yeah, so, that's, and that's exactly it. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't even have to talk to us about uh, permit the product or about the Obel or open source project. You can just talk to us about uh, technology in general. We always enjoy yeah. that. Um, so yeah, uh, Philip, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Sor. Thanks for everyone watching and uh, have a great year. Bye, everyone.